All right. Happy Friday, everybody. And I hope you had a great week. Thanks, uh, all of you who watch and follow this. If you find it helpful, if you find it advantageous, I would encourage you or ask that you share it with someone. Give it a rating review. I always appreciate that. And um, yeah, and if you're this is the first time you're hearing, hopefully you find some value in it. And feel free to send me a message if you don't. Give me some feedback along the way. I do this ultimately for the benefit of those who watch and listen. So hey, if there's something that isn't helpful, then tell me and I will do my best to change. All right. So this week, if you're not familiar, I've got a rundown on the latest happenings at business, tech, and uh, human experience. I'm limiting it to four this week because my first one is more of a personal one that relates to a lot of what's happening in the industry. And so I just want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then I'll get into three other big ones that were very interesting to me this week. So the first one, kicking this off, you know, if you've listened to any of my updates over the past few weeks, I've talked at length about these companies that are going through massive downsizing, they're going through layoffs, they're all of this and the uncertainty that's creating for its employees. And so I myself this week got to experience that firsthand. So for those of you who may not be familiar with me on LinkedIn, or maybe you haven't been following me very long, I my previous role, I think technically still on paper, it is my current role, was the chief learning officer for a large healthcare organization. And so I oversaw the development and skill growth of all of our employees. And that position was eliminated this week. And I just found that out. And so for me, this isn't the first time I've experienced this, but for me, everything I've been talking about over the past few weeks really hit home. It really hit close to home. And my empathy levels for what everyone else right now is going through, whether you've been impacted or whether there's just I got off a call this morning from a bunch of execs and just the nature of everyone feeling like things are extremely uncertain. And, you know, personally, I am experiencing firsthand the number of emotions that I think everyone goes through as they potentially lose a job. And quite frankly, if you haven't been through it before, I will say I think every professional should experience it at least once. It's a very interesting experience that is challenging, but also really powerful in your own growth and development. Uh, so not that I would encourage anyone to go seek it out, but if it happens to you as some encouragement, I will tell you if you approach it the right way, it can be very beneficial to you as an individual and to your career. But I'm right in the heat of that right now. You know, going through the emotions of a loss, going through all the questions of this, but at the same time, I also have been talking to a lot of people who I left behind and recognize there's a lot of emotions. And so people who maybe you aren't the one experiencing and feeling this, but I'm very sensitive to the fact that just because you aren't impacted by a layoff directly, it does impact you. And I've been there and talked with people who they're wrestling through the struggle of being left behind and feeling like, why this person? Why not me? And that's not an easy road to carry either. And so, like I said, I think there's a lot of emotions that I'm seeing, experiencing, not only myself, but in the people that I encounter, that I talk to, and it's become much more real. And so I wanted to open with that because I know this is an area that a lot of people are wrestling with right now. And I think there's often a tendency to want to puff up posture, pretend it's all good, pretend that this isn't affecting us, pretending everything's fine. And the number of people I encounter who really are struggling, whether they've lost their job or not, is serious. And so I just wanted to take some time to put that out there, not really for any ask so much as to encourage anybody who watches and listens to this, who may be going through something, maybe struggling with this, maybe you just lost your job, maybe you are the person who didn't, uh, to find some people that can be a support to you and to be open and honest and vulnerable. I know one of the hardest things for me was, you know, there's this tendency, especially when you're someone who has a significant following and it seems like on paper, you've got, you know, it all figured out. There can be this pressure to want to create this persona, this image that you're impenetrable, you're, you know, whatever, nothing really gets to you. And it was very difficult to be open and honest about it and be vulnerable about the situation and the state. And I can just tell you from personal experience, the choice to do that 
has been exponentially rewarding. It has been rewarding to be open and vulnerable. And I get that can be not how you may feel. You may feel pressure to not do that. But having gone through this, I'm usually really good at being encouraging and supporting to other people. I'm terrible at receiving it. And the outpouring of support from people, I cannot even begin to say how meaningful that has been. And I think that's something many people miss out on when you are constantly trying to create this perception, this persona that you have it all figured out and nothing really gets to you and you'll be fine and you don't want to open up and you don't want to share. Are you putting yourself at risk? Sure, you absolutely are. And is there a risk that you'll get hurt? There absolutely is. But I can say from firsthand experience now that I have vastly benefited more from the kindness, the generosity, the encouragement that has come from that. And it has vastly outweighed any of the risks. So I just want to encourage anybody who's struggling to build those connections, to be vulnerable with someone else. Obviously, do it wisely. I'm not suggesting everybody needs to go be public about things and things like that. You got to do it wisely. But if you are someone who is going through a hard time, if you are struggling with something, I would encourage you not to bottle it up, to box it in, to try and hide that. And this is coming from somebody who has historically struggled with that. And it has taken many years for me to be able to go past and move through that and be able to be in a place where I can be more honest and vulnerable about how things really are. And so I think, yeah, that's that's just where things are. And so my heart really goes out to people who are in a similar state right now, who may be struggling um, with some of these exact same challenges, because there is a lot of uncertainty. And if you listen to my stuff for any period of time, you know that I talk a lot about what is going on in the world of work and what is happening and what these companies are doing and what they're trying to wrestle with. I think the other thing that I would encourage people who, especially people who have lost their jobs or maybe you suspect it's coming, normally there's always a suspicion in the back of your mind that this might happen, but you just never believe it will. And when it first hits, there is that sense of just frustration and anger. And I can tell you firsthand that I have experienced and felt all of those emotions. But one of the things that I've been really open about is I'm making a conscious choice to choose gratitude in that. And gratitude is not my emotional response to how I'm feeling, because I can tell you right now, the emotional response to how I'm feeling (laughs) would not be gratitude. Uh, But that I can tell you from my, my experience that it is possible to do that. And for anybody who listens and watches, you know my faith background. And so I don't claim to have the strength to do it myself. I firmly believe that strength comes from the one who created me. But I know it's possible to get there. And uh, I guess my my kind of concluding thoughts that has been something that I've been meditating on heavily for anybody, regardless of what uncertainty, whether it's job, whether it's health, whether it's whatever, uh, I've been spending a lot of time meditating on Matthew 6, 33 and 34, which says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries Today is trouble enough for today. And a couple things for me that have been really hard about that, two things in particular that hopefully this, anybody who listens and watches can relate to this. The first of all, one is I like to have things figured out. And so it has been very difficult for me to say, I don't know even where to start with things. And I know there's a lot of people struggling with that, even if it's AI is coming and I, I don't even know what to do, or I lost my job, or I am experiencing this, or my company's going through that. I know that feeling of, I don't even know what to do. And so that sense of worry about tomorrow, and it's it's been really hard for me to have to do that. And I think this has been an encouragement and a constant reminder, and I would remind everybody else to let go of some of those things that you can't control because it'll just tear you apart. And I think the other thing that Sometimes I've had people even, (laughs) actually, in the last 24 hours, I've had several conversations with people who have said, give you everything you need. Like, you just lost your job. How can you hold on to the hope that you're going to have everything you need? You just lost everything you need, right? And 
one of the things I've learned over the years is a lot of times I have to readjust my definition of what I need to God's. And that's not always easy. And so part of this process over the last 48 hours or whatever has been about saying, but what do I really need? And are those things covered? And as I go back to that, it's really helped me lean into this attitude of gratitude. And I didn't say that because it's a cliche thing to say, but truly it has where I've gone, you know what? Do I have a place to live? Do I have a family who cares about me? The overwhelming support I've felt and received from people. Have I gotten the encouragement that helps me want to step forward into the future? Yes. Do I have certainty about what I'll have tomorrow? No. Do I know for sure I'll land another job? No. As much as people say, well, Christopher, you've got all that. I'm sure you'll be fine. It's like, I don't know that. Heck, I could be dead tomorrow. But do I have everything I need? I do. And so I just wanted to open with that just as kind of a personal note on where things are. And I even debated doing a weekly update this week, but I'm like, you know what? I do it because I love it. And I do it because I hear from people that this helps them navigate the world around them. And that's why I do this. So hopefully this was encouraging to whoever it is, whoever hears it, whoever needs it. Uh, and also just so you kind of know if I'm a little out of sorts or different or a little quieter than usual, that's probably why. Um, but also if you're someone who is struggling, and you just need somebody to say, hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I'm not sure what to do. Just know uh, you can get in touch with me on LinkedIn, whatever. I, uh, I, my door is my virtual door. I mean, you can't come to my house, but my virtual door is always open. So with that, that is update number one on kind of where things are. I will probably do occasional updates just to let people know where things are at and how things are progressing along. Um, but there's some other things that I'll give an update on in the future here that I'm, I'm not at liberty to share at this point. So I'll, I'll hold my tongue for now. All right, let's transition to update number two. So last week, if you missed it, I talked about a really comprehensive study that went into the impact of AI on worker burnout and engagement. And it was something else, in many ways, not surprising but in many ways surprising. And so if you didn't catch that, I actually clipped it and I released that earlier this week. So if you only want to watch that part, you don't have to watch the whole thing. You can go catch that on YouTube. It's not on, on any of the podcasts, but you can catch that. This week I came across another study that was really interesting. And the study was about the impacts of AI on creativity. So this was put out by a psychological organization. So just like last time, I'll describe the study because I'm always very, very skeptical when I say studies say, because so often people don't take the time to dig into the study and actually understand it. And so as I look at this study, let me tell you, I will not by any means say this study is 100% conclusive because as I get into some of the limitations, no, but I think there are enough things that as I look across the broader landscape, it very much matches what I'm seeing in other studies, in other bigger things, what I'm seeing from a holistic workforce trend um, and just the way AI is, we're adapting to it. So what this study was, was it was looking at how AI affects human creativity. And the way they did it was they focused on writing skills. So creative writing is where they narrowed the scope. Now, in terms of size of study, and this is where I say, don't go say, well, this is conclusive 100% for sure, because it really only included 293 participants and they were not professional writers. So in some ways, I actually really ex respect that because it wasn't designed to be, you know, hey, these are professionals and let's see how it's doing. It was really to look at the average person to see, hey, how does AI affect their writing? And um, well, I guess... So, so anyway, that's what it was. I misspoke on the participants. There were 600 and then 293, so what, like 900 people. So it was a decent-sized study. Not small, but not exactly, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So keep that in mind with it. The other thing that I think was really interesting or that you have to be careful is when they look at it, it was a, what they had to write was just an eight sentence story. So we're not talking, you know, write a white paper or write a, a, a novel or anything like that. So again, the scope of it, and I guarantee people could tear it apart and say, well, that's not really measuring creativity. I don't think that's the point. You also have to look, they were using one shot approaches to AI, which I think is another thing to be careful of. So if you look at how they used AI, when they tested it, writers were... So there were three groups. There was do it just human, then just AI, then AI with humans. 
type of a thing. And one of the things you have to be careful of is, again, there's limitations in that because you can say, well, they used AI and it didn't make them better. But in these one shot experiments, it's like, well, they were only allowed to ask one question. They, they couldn't sit and iterate on what they are, which really, in my opinion, is where AI can be really good. So there are some limitations to that. I also doesn't say much about their experience with AI. So, you know, how good are they at prompting and all this? I'm not trying to dismiss the value of the study. I just want people to be objective about the kind of study. But what came out of it, I think, was really interesting in that the study showed generative AI actually increased the novelty and the usefulness of the stories versus just human only efforts. So when they compared people to people with AI, and again, these are just average people. They are not professional writers, classically trained in all this stuff. It actually made them more creative and their stories were more interesting with it, which doesn't surprise me. My own personal experience, I do a lot with AI generated images. They really help me with some of the stuff. And I'm not, while I did design work, I am out of practice with it. And if you ask me to go into InDesign or you know anything like that and create something, I'm not that kind of a designer. But I like visual compelling imagery with it. And a lot of times there's something that's in my head that I, I could never put in artwork. And AI is really good for that. And so it doesn't surprise me that you have people who are average people, writers, being asked to come up with a creative story, which they maybe in their head have some concept of it, but they're struggling with figuring out how to put together. And what it showed was AI actually improved it. The people actually did better when they had that AI helping shape and mold that. Um, and so it helped them brainstorm ideas, which was another one. It showed you know they had access to AI generated ideas. So maybe they didn't know where to start. AI was able to give them some, what if you did this? What if you did that? Which then really kickstarted it, which doesn't surprise me. Um, but again, I think it's really helpful. And what they found was it really had a positive impact on less creative writers. Now, one of the interesting things about it though, was the evaluator perspective was really interesting. Um, while objectively, the stories were better, with AI involved in it, the evaluators, the human evaluators were more critical of the stories when AI was on there. And I think that's something that we have to be really mindful of. And anybody thinking about this or who is using AI, we still are in this stage where there is this perception from people that if you're using AI to help you, it's like a crutch, like somehow I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. And I don't necessarily think that's inherently bad, but I think it's something we need to be mindful of. You know, I think if people do have this assistance, if they do have things like that, it ties to the worker burnout thing. And I think this is where we have to be so careful as we draw the line. Is it reasonable to say, hey, you have AI to help you with this. The, there should be an improvement in quality or speed of what you're creating because I know you now have some help. I think there is some room for us to do that. But I think we also have to be careful. And so as I looked at the data on evaluator perception, they were pretty critical of this stuff. And I think that's what we're seeing with some of the AI burnout stuff relating to last week's study is we haven't quite landed where our perception of AI use is where it should be. And we can tend to be either we believe it can just do incredible things or we're overly critical when it gets involved. And so I think that's something that we have to be really careful of. Now, one of the things that I thought was interesting about AI with this was when they actually looked at just the AI stories, you know, people say, oh, AI is creative. It can do all this stuff. It has creativity with it. When they actually compared the stories that were purely AI generated, um, while they might've been decent stories, they were very robotic. And I think that's good news for us as people that this, again, while a small study showed that, okay, could AI write creative stories? It could. Would AI create creative write of stories? Creative stories? Not really. They, you know, as you look into the data, it looks like, well, they all kind of felt the same. They all kind of had the exact same kind of plot and themes and risks that kind of came in. And so 
that very much matches what I see with a lot of the stuff out there where you, I think anybody watching and listening to this, we're starting to, our ears are perking up and we're picking up more. And this feels very AI-ish. This feels very robotic. It feels very bland. And so I think in some ways, this just goes to some of the other things that I talk about at length where people still play a really unique role and the data continues to show to me that that's not going away. While it may change, because I think there's a lot of what we do that is robotic in nature and we don't realize it. And when you think about writing a story, how many different story styles are there? You know, things like that. But I think this is where we're going to continue to navigate that. Well, what is truly dynamic and unique from people and what is not? But it was encouraging to see that when people really looked at those AI stories, they went, yeah, I mean, they're, they're good. But they all kind of feel the same. And so I think in terms of takeaways from this, if you're someone who's still anti-AI, who's avoiding it, saying I'm not going to use it because there's just something better about me doing it by myself, I would encourage you to be more active in using it as a partner, as something to help you get started with things, as something to help stretch you where maybe you have limitations. Like I said, for me, I am not a graphic designer, so I can't come up with graphic design. If I wanted something really professionally produced, I would go to a graphic designer who specialized in that, who I would hope is using AI to make them even better. But for those things where I go, I need a graphic, but not to the level I need a graphic designer, AI actually stretches my ability. And so for anyone who's not doing that yet, I would very much encourage that. But I think really ultimately what the takeaway for this is, is that this is continuing to show that AI plus people done right. And I think that's where, as I looked into the way they structure it, there are things I would do differently about the study. And as I you know, support and advise companies, I spend a lot of time helping companies figure out what is that? Where do we draw that line? What are the things that AI is involved in? What are the things that people are involved in? And it's not an easy, here, AI does this, people do that. There's some really hard work that has to happen. But I think this study is yet another little notch in the camp of, hey, we're going to be working together and we're just going to further integrate. And yeah. So anyway, that's that one. All right. So this other one, this one, I just kind of put my head on the desk when I read this. So there's this AI friend pendant and I actually saw the commercial for it and I went, what on earth is this thing? Um, <laughs> I thought it was fake. I actually thought it was fake the first time I saw it. So I'm like, is this for real? And then I looked into it and I'm like, no, this is actually a legit thing. And I can't remember the company that does it. But if you Google AI friend or search GPT AI for whatever, you can look this thing up. Um, and I would encourage you to go out and look at the commercial for it. And I would be very curious your reactions to it because what it is, and they literally advertise that this is what it is. It's always listening. And it's this little, honestly, it looks like a Tamaguchi, which if you're not familiar with what that is, maybe that's dating me. It was like those little like plastic pendant things that you used to feed your Pats. I don't know why I'm going on this rabbit hole. But anyway, that's what it looks like. And it's they're in the bright colors of like an iMac. Quite frankly, looking at it, I'm not a fashion person, but looking at it, if I saw somebody walking around with this glowing <laughs> bright colored pendant, I'd be like, maybe put that under your shirt. But given the fact that it's always listening, I guess I understand why it's got to be out because it's essentially what it's doing. And they literally say, this thing is designed to be your companion, your friend. It's designed and they're talking about it's going to combat loneliness and all this. And I'm watching this and it's a commercial of people, you know, walking around and they're doing things and then their phone buzzes and then they kind of smile and text it back and then put their phone back in their pocket. And I, at first I'm like, what is it doing? And essentially what it does, this AI friend is with you has 15 hours of battery life. So aside from when you're sleeping, you can wear this thing everywhere all day long. You just charge it like your Apple watch every day. And then you wear it when you're up and it's listening to everything you do. And then it'll just text you. And you know, one of the examples is your friends are ribbing you while you're playing video games. Then it texts you like, ah, you know, totally whatever. And the guy smiles and puts his phone back in. 
So it really is trying to say, hey, this can be your friend, which the greatest, some of them, I went, okay, to the marketing person, fine. You know, some of them, the person was alone. And so I was like, okay, still not sure that this is healthy or good for your psychology and mental state, but at least the person was alone and then they had this companion with them. Okay, I've got my own thoughts on that by itself. But the ones that really made me go, you have got to be kidding me, is where people in the commercial are literally engaging and spending time with other people and then they stop engaging with other people to engage with their phone so they can talk to their AI friend. And I just went, there is so many things that are wrong with this. There are so many things that are wrong with this. Like one of the examples was literally a girl sitting with her boyfriend, you know, whatever. And her, her AI friend texts her some, you know, thing about the relationship and she smiles and, you know, he's the one or something like that. And I just went, are you kidding me? This is not what we need in society. And I get there's a lot of loneliness out there. I get people are struggling with this. But even going back to my very first point about what I've been going through with the loss of a job, I don't need to cope and grieve and go through that with an AI chatbot. I need to cope and grieve and go through that with a real human being and a real friend. Now, do I think this thing's going to be successful? I don't really know, to be completely honest with you. We're in a really weird state in society. And so what I don't want to do is just write it off as that's so stupid because there's examples of things that have not gone well. The humane pin, the rabbit R1, they haven't done well. But this thing's 99 bucks. You can tell from the marketing, it is very much targeted at Gen Z, Gen Alpha, kind of this, this is the new age of friendship. And so while as older generations may sneer and snark at it and say, that's so stupid and cheesy and I'd never wear that thing, you know, I can see older generations, lonely people leaning on something like this. I can see the young generations growing up think this, thinking this is totally normal to say, hey, I'm with my group of friends, but really I'm not here because I'm actually getting an AI opinion on the situation. And I'm sure it's actually, I haven't experimented with it. You know, if you want to say, if somebody wants to send me one, I'll do a, you know, 24 hours with my AI friend video or something like that. But it's built on Cloud 3.5, Anthropics Cloud 3.5. So it's on a pretty solid model in terms of having a pretty human-ish feeling interaction. Um, so I actually would not be surprised if there are people who maybe do lean into this more. And while maybe it's still the early stages where it's a little cliche, a little weird, people might look at you sideways if you show up with something like this. I do think we are going to move into an age where this becomes much more normal. And I think we might be in the clunky, weird stage. I guarantee there was a stage where we thought smartphones were so stupid. I mean, I remember when it used to be considered so rude to be on your phone in a group. And now you go out in a public setting and it's almost weird when you see somebody not on their phone. And so I think this is something we need to be careful of and that We've in many ways lost our ability to connect with people on a human level. And so, like I said, going back to my first point, if you don't have those relationships, if you don't have people that you can connect with, find them. Find real friends that you can text and can tell what's going on in your life. Find real human beings that you can let in and share what's going on and what you're wrestling through, who can actually speak to you as another human being and can care for you in that way. And I get it's scary. I get it's overwhelming. And I also get it's work. I think that's one of the other things that is very dangerous about tools like this is that relationships are hard. And we as a species have this really bad tendency of wanting to find the easy way out. What's the easiest, quickest, least you know, risky path to take. And I think that's what AI can offer is, hey, you want somebody who will respond to you, who can kind of share experience with you, but you don't really got to put yourself out there. You don't really got to risk them hurting your feelings. You don't really got to risk anything, but with no risk, there's no reward. And I think that's one of the things that we miss is we think AI can serve in this capacity. And like I said, I get a fair amount of people might go, 
oh, that's stupid. I would never buy one of those things. Maybe you wouldn't, but maybe somebody else would. Or maybe you wouldn't right now because your situation is such that you don't need something like this. But who's to say you might not be in a vulnerable state where suddenly the idea, or maybe there's a less cliche version, maybe it's just integrated in your Apple Watch and you don't have to wear a goofy, brightly colored pendant around your neck. And suddenly it doesn't become quite so weird. And suddenly you start building a friendship with an AI bot. And I've just had enough per personal interactions with people where this kind of stuff can go sideways really fast. So while it's in some ways entertaining and interesting to watch, in some ways I do have legitimate concerns that we're going to see more of this stuff. The fact Humane, Rabbit, and now the AI friend have all come out in the past not that long, just because they haven't been successful and an AI fr friend is still TBD, but just because they haven't been successful yet, it is speaking to an underlying trend that we are seeing companies lean into and the conditions are right for something like this to take hold. It's just a matter of a company figuring out how to do it in a way where it's not seen as weird. And I don't think we're that far off from it. So with that, all right. Last one I've got is if you have not been uh, following AI regulations, there's some big changes coming for AI tech companies. And it's all related to the EU's AI Act, which is already in effect. It went into effect at the beginning of this month. And it is the world's first comprehensive framework now in the design to regulate artificial intelligence. Now that's the that's the PR line, right? And it probably is true. It probably is the most comprehensive that we have today. Having known GDPR and having worked with all these things, I have no hope that the EU AI Act will solve for all the problems. But it is definitely a big one, and it is definitely one that is turning some heads in terms of what this means and the implications that it has. And I think underneath it, I think they're trying to do the right thing, which is they really are trying to take a risk-based approach to regulate AI that doesn't put so much restriction on it that we can't innovate with AI anymore while still putting enough restriction on it that we don't end up creating something that destroys us as a species. And so one of the first steps is it's actually creating risk categories. So there are some comprehensive terms and, and scales for how they're assessing whether a technology, AI technology, what risk level it has. And so there's minimal, limited, high, and unacceptable, where, you know, again, they, they are now, and there's an update that I'm not going to get to, but there's something that the government's involved with, with uh, OpenAI, that's similar to this, where they're trying to figure out how do we assess, and even just getting categories right. So hang on, I just kind of lost my train of thought. Okay, so the first piece is they're trying to figure out like wh where do we draw lines? And honestly, as much as maybe the lines that we're drawing right now for those four things may not be perfect, having lines is a start and we have not had that at all. And so I have tremendous respect for the work that went into this and having looked into the act, yeah, there's things in it that I go, ah, I don't know if I would do it quite that way or whatever. But one of the things that I think is awesome is at least we've drawn some lines now. At least we're now taking AI and putting it into categories and saying, we believe there is this level of risk associated with these things. And we're probably going to see adjustments to it. There's probably going to be implications that we don't see. But I have said for a long time now, gosh, if we can just get a framework out there that we can universally agree on and the EU doing this. I have a sneaking suspicion is going to start to set a global standard around this. So it's going to be interesting to watch how they actually outline systems and how they categorize these different technologies and whether it will evolve and adapt or whether it will just stand as is. So something to be watching for with that one. This though, you know, you may hear this and go, oh, this is just like with the EU and this is why Facebook's Llama 3 wasn't allowed in the EU, you might go, this has nothing to do with me if I'm a stateside listener or I'm not somebody who's in the EU. Yes, it absolutely does. Because what's interesting about it is just like GDPR affected a lot of 
companies because they had global workers in these other regions. If these tech companies want any hope of having their products available to the EU, which is a very large market, they have to comply with this. And ultimately, this is why Meta said, we're just not even going to allow Llama 3 to release to the EU because Meta wasn't ready to comply. And I don't think there was enough criteria and framework around this for them really to go, okay, fine, you're going to hold us up with regulation. We just won't make it available. But we're going to quickly get to a point where that's not going to be a, an acceptable solution. And now with this in place, every tech company around the world is going to have to look at their tech and go, if we choose to not adjust our strategy, adjust our technology to meet these requirements and you know build it around these kinds of things, then we are literally writing off any hope of being able to leverage our technology in a very, very large market. And digging into it, you know, some people would go, ah, oh, we don't need this. It's going to stop innovation. I actually think they've done a really good job in terms of creating regulatory sandboxes and places where they can test things so that they can do their best to objectively evaluate the risk categories for this stuff. Uh, there's some teeth behind this, the financial penalties for not <laughs> complying with this are serious. And if you're somebody who goes, this will never stick, just look up GDPR and the impact that it has had on data practices and not just in Europe, but for the rest of the world. And if you're an exec or a person who's worked in data in any major organization, you know sometimes what a headache it can be and you do not want to mess with this. So I do think this is actually going to, this may be the slowdown I'm not going to say this will be, but this may be the slowdown that many have been calling for around AI, and it's here now. So the EU doing this, putting it into effect in August, the rigor around this, the teeth behind non-compliance with this, it is going to make every tech company think twice. And the, oh, I didn't know about it. It's not going to fly. If you've messed with GDPR, you do not mess around. And so I think there's a lot of companies, Amazon, Meta, Google, like they're all now in kind of a scramble mode having to go back. And I think there's a lot of companies who they knew this was coming. The, the whole free reign of AI, it wasn't going to last forever. So a lot of these companies are already on it. And there's people on both sides of the fence. There's people who are opposed to it because they think it's just going to overregulate and I think there's some legitimate risk to it, to be honest with you. You know, on the while I'm very encouraged by the fact we're finally putting some teeth into creating frameworks, creating structure, creating some of this stuff. I think some of my biggest concerns around it are um, one, who's really evaluating and ensuring this? I mean, who oversees this stuff, honestly, in many regards, has more impact on the regulations themselves. And so are they being done well? And it's still too early to tell. It's still way too early to tell whether this will have that kind of impact. I think what's going to be really interesting though to watch is, um, you know, sometimes regulations actually can make things worse because <laughs> when there's regulations, it leads to people trying to find ways around regulations. And when you know what you can't do, you try and find every way to be able to do that without technically doing it. Uh, now, you know, I think there's a lot of really good actors out there that they're not going to do that. But I think sometimes it, let's just say, don't put your hope in the AI act of the EU solving all our problems around AI. And I think that's been my biggest concern in watching some of this stuff is some of the things that are out there is like, finally, we've solved the AI crisis. And I'm like, this isn't going to solve the crisis. It may is a good first step. It can absolutely help. It may serve as a foundation for some of the things we're going to need to be successful with it. But it's not a it's not a one shot solution to all of the risks that we're dealing with with AI. But um, that said, I'm really interested to see how they start categorizing some of this stuff. The government's involvement is in AI is really starting to step up. I'll probably talk a little bit more about that next week because that is really one of the things I'm seeing more and more of, which depending on your opinion on government could be great. It could be terrible. Um, and I think there's good arguments on both sides of that. So 
But all that to say, that is a really, really big development in the AI space. And I think it's something everybody should watch. And just because you don't live in the EU does not mean it does not apply to you. So I'd encourage everybody to go out there, take a look at the act, take a look at the different categories, take a look at the implications on this, because I think it's going to be interesting to see how this actually influences and affects the trajectory of AI. And I do think it will, in some ways, level out the exponential orders of magnitude that we've seen. I don't think it's going to flatten it, uh, but I do think we are going to see some leveling out as a result of this. Time will tell. So those are the big updates I've got this week. It's a little shorter than usual, uh, but I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, wonderful weekend. And uh, next week, if you didn't catch my sub stack from this week, uh, I'm shifting my release schedule of my conversational podcasts to every other week for a period of time here while things are a little bit uncertain. Uh, and then I'll probably go back to weekly conversations once there, but I will continue doing my best to try and do the weekly updates. There's some things coming up. I may have to take a little bit of a break, but we will see. I like doing these too much. So with that, I hope you have a great week, great weekend, and we will see you on the other side. <laughs>